Hello, everyone. This is Matt Hoots, and I've got a special guest today. I've got Ken Nelson with Panasonic, and he is going to talk to us about ventilation, more specifically balanced ventilation. I know with COVID in the news, with wildfires and all other kinds of things out there, we're talking about how do we get clean air into our houses. So Panasonic has a new ERV, and ERV is an energy recovery ventilator that helps bring that fresh air into your house while getting rid of some of the bad air in your house. Thanks, Ken, for joining us and, and sharing this information with us. Hey, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for having me. And uh, I kind of look forward to running through this. This is something that we're taking very seriously at Panasonic. In fact, one of our critical initiatives is, is to get balanced ventilation to the forefront of the builder's mind as a strategy within his house. So our IntelliBalance 200 is essentially a 200 CFM application that complements our 100 CFM and, and our 20, 30, 40 CFM applications. So we're, we're pretty excited about this product. Um, we're gonna, we'll cover all three of them a little bit, but for the most part, uh, I wanna talk about just the ERV science and how ERVs work. So it makes it easier to understand how these things are, are all about, what these things are all about. So a couple of key terms we wanna talk about is we're gonna have supply air that's coming from the outside. We have exhaust air that's going from the inside to the outside. You're gonna hear about static pressure, which is the resistance within those ducting that the fan has to work against. Uh, Pascals, which is basically a measurement of the energy used to move air through that duct. And then inside the ERV itself, there's a core exchanger where the two air flows pass by but don't touch one another. Another key issue with ERVs is a defrost or a defrost strategy that prevents that supply airstream from freezing, um, for freezing within the core area and so, so forth. There's condensation, which is, you know, a lot of people understand condensation as the phase change from a water vapor to a liquid, which is really important relative to that defrost strategy. Um, a couple of fuzzy terms that we don't hear necessarily all the time is ballistic or ballistic trajectory. Um, when our particulates, there's a, there's a, a, a basically it's a, a, an idea that most people have about things that are in the air and that they either fly or fall. Uh, ballistic is the fall. So if an object is propelled, like you throw a baseball, it will, it could rise up for a moment based on that propel, propulsive force, if you will, but then it'll fall, right? But there's also buoyancy. And buoyancy is the tendency of an object or particulate to sink, rise, or float, like the feather that you see on the side of the screen there. So in our house, we have these different air flows that will allow for items that are buoyant, which are these two point particulates, 2.5 pp particulates, you know, the um, there, even if you want to talk about COVID, the COVID virus particulates, the real small particulates will float. With buoyancy, and this is one of the biggest challenges we have in indoor air quality, right, is that for, for ventilation, we want ventilation to be predictable and uneventful, meaning that I don't want to wait for this feather to have to fall on its own or stick or adhere to something to get it out of the air. Same thing with that virus or particulate, right? I can't wait for it to get out of there. So we create a, a predictable airflow throughout the house, an air change, if you will, and then it becomes uh, uneventful. I don't have to wait for a window to be open for the wind to blow or, or anything like that. And we do that with both continuous run ventilation and intermittent ventilation. So there's a couple of other terms, the habitable space, right? So we hear about habitable space as a term in the and with fresh air, we we typically like to have the hap, the fresh air moved into the habitable space. The habitable space is anywhere you would take a nap in the house, right? So I want fresh air where the occupants are going to be. I don't need fresh air into a bathroom necessarily because I'm going to have an exhaust air coming out of the bathroom. But I want fresh air into the bedroom. I don't need fresh air into the utility room. I want fresh air out of the living room. I don't necessarily need fresh air into the kitchen but I'm going to take exhaust air out of the kitchen. So wherever the occupants are going to potentially take a nap, a media room or something like that. So, and the building envelope is another one that can throw people because 
if you have an attached garage, that attached garage is not necessarily part of the envelope. The attached garage or the envelope is typically defined as the conditioned space. So if you're heating or cooling that space, that's considered within the envelope of the space. And we don't typically heat or cool our garages. So uh, a couple of different organizations that we roll up to are what we call I-Codes, the International Residential Code, International Mechanical Code, the International Energy Conservation Code. And then there's what they call standards uh, and above code standards. Um, so the ASHRAE 62.2 is an above code ventilation standard that typically the I-Codes will refer to. California's Title 24 is another example of an above code energy standard. Um, and if you were in California, they would refer to that as, as part of their above code program. Um, the other term that we should be careful with would be HRVs. And I've written HRV with a small s as a heat recovery ventilation system, right? In all of your codes, they refer to a heat recovery ventilation system. Within the heat recovery ventilation system, is the HRV, the heat recovery ventilator, and the ERV, the energy recovery ventilator. These, the HRV and the ERV are very, very similar. The difference is in the core of an ERV, it has basically a, a capillary process that allows the water vapor from one airstream to move to the other airstream. And we'll get into that here in a few minutes. Um, the heat recovery is, is, again, it's similar, where I'm gonna take, uh, exterior supply air and I will bring that through the core and it'll put that fresh air to the occupants. Then you have what they call return air. Return air goes through the core, then it becomes exhaust air. So that's and, and with an HRV, no moisture transfers between those two air streams. So that has a condensation uh, line that will, will take that moisture out. The challenge with the HRV is that you know, if you're in the middle of the summertime in somewhere where it's already dry, it just continues to make the air drier. Um, and so, for example, if you're in a cold climate where it was 10 degrees outside, the outside humidity drops to hardly anything. And because it, it just freezes, freezes right out of the air. And then we want to hold on to humidity inside the house because literally a lot of your wood products in the house will become too dry. They'll start to check up and and, and dry out and warp. Um, if you've ever been in a log house during a, a dry season, it's uh, it can be frightening because that thing will crack and it'll sound like gunshots going off. It's, it's pretty interesting sometimes. So the ERV um, transfers, uses the water vapor as part of that transfer mechanism where the HRV just uses conduction, right? Conduction through this this uh, non-permeable material, uh, like aluminum foil, basically between the two airstreams, where the ERV allows this capillary process to let that moisture move from one airstream to the other. So during the drier, hot summer months, humid months, it's humid months. It's going to, excuse me, during hot, humid summer months, it'll keep the home cooler because it'll help keep some of the moisture in. Uh, excuse me, to keep the moisture out. And in the winter, it keeps the moisture in. So ERVs, the pros, they, they maintain your air tightness without compromising indoor, meaning that you can tighten your house up so you don't have random air changes because you have a predictable value of air change. It holds the moisture so that you have a predictable moisture value in your house. You're not pumping in 98% humidity air from outside uh, into the house and having it having your air conditioner trying to hold off all that moisture. Um, it gives you a cleaner, healthier indoor air because as part of that process, you're going to filter that air as it comes in. And then at the end of the day, you'll have savings from reduced maintenance cost on everything because having that tempered air is going to allow your HVAC system to work less, less uh, hard, if you will. It won't work as hard, so you'll have better value with that. This, you know, the downside, of course, is that um, that's, it costs money, right? It, it, all of them have a, have a transaction cost on the front end of it. And you may not have a return on your investment. And I caution people always who think that, you know, over the course of time, they're going to recapture the money they spend on the installation. And that's not generally going to be the case. But you will capture the money return on the quality of the air that you're breathing. So if you have asthmas, allergies, COPDs, 
or any other, you know, breathing issues, having fresh air coming into your house and not having these reactions will save you a ton of money in healthcare and, and misery. So, so again, just to recap, it's the ERV is an HVAC device that provides balanced, energy efficient ventilation. Okay. It transfers heat and moisture between the incoming fresh filtered air and the outgoing stale air. And that moisture can go either direction. Typically what it's going to look for is it's going to have what they call an absolute humidity value, which is how much moisture is in the airstream. And it'll go to the airstream that has less moisture. Moisture is going to move from a higher density place to a lower density place. So the heat recovery ventilator, it's similar to the ERV, except it only transfers heat energy, not moisture. So, and by expelling the moist air there in the winter, the HRV may cause indoor air to become too dry. Um, the HRV and the ERV include exhaust and supply fans and have an energy transfer core. Those are all givens within the HRV ERV families. A portion of the transfer core of an ERV is made from what they call a permeable material so that the moisture moves from one airstream to the other. So how it works is the heat transfer is pretty simple, right? You have both a, a conduction where it's, it's touching a warmer surface or a cooler surface and that heat moves from hot to cold. Um, and that way the, the one airstream absorbs the heat from the other. And then the second key is how the water vapor moves via capillarity. Okay. So in the way back, you know, in the eight, 1930s, Dr. Frank Rowley, a professor at Minnesota University was was basically researching heat flow through the different building materials. And he just he determined that vapor diffusion could carry a thermal load, meaning moisture actually had temperature associated with it, which, you know, makes sense, but no one really thought about it in that way. He was also able to document how a combination of materials and temperature affected what moisture movement through a, through a material, right? The larger the temperature difference, the higher the capillary movement. So when you see a latent percentage of, of energy uh, captured or lost on a, on a specification sheet, basically you have a real cold temperature and a real warm temperature with humidity. That latent is how much of that moisture is going to move from one airstream to the other. And that'll have to do with the, the, the type of core and the material. But the more the temperature differences, the higher that movement will occur more movement will occur. So as that heat energy drains away, the vapor, water vapor will collect or condensate on the surface's colder side. That's how it's pulling it across. Okay. As the air flows continue along their path, the, the moisture is going to either be evacuated out of the house or into the house, depending on how it's been balanced from one side to the other, whether it's given up or gained grains of, grains of moisture. And these managed humidity levels reduce the potential of condensation on cold surfaces inside the building envelope. And thus, that reduces the, the mold and mildew growth potential as well. So the way it works is you have here, you have warm moisture on the, on the side of this capillary example. And you have cooler air up here on the top. And it literally, the warmer air, the warmer moisture has a more excited molecular st structure. So it's going to push towards the colder air and the colder air because it's condensating or attempting to condensate on the top is going to literally draw that to that space as that heat moves to the cold. And that's how you'll move moisture from one airstream to the other. So, but it only travels in a vapor because these capillaries are so small, they don't allow liquid water to pass through. So, ERVs or energy recovery ventilators recover both latent and sensible energy. The latent energy is that moisture component, right? It, it balances that moisture from one airstream to the other. The sensible energy is simply heat. That's the conductive component of it. So, for example, uh, in, in a cold to warm energy transfer, let's say um, outside, you know, outside the air supply from outside is 50 degrees and our house is 70 degrees, right? So I have a 20 degree delta. And if I am, what we use here as our example, basically 66, um, excuse me, 80%, uh, let's say I had an 80% efficient core. I have a 20 degree delta, that's 16 degrees. 
So I can take and, and know that I'm going to recapture 16 degrees from that exhaust air from the inside. So this will go to 66 degrees on the inside. Now my furnace system only has to pick up four degrees, which is pretty efficient for the furnace, right? That's, that's basically saving a lot of energy and money, but it gives you that predictable airflow throughout the house or that predictable air exchange. So in hot to cold, you can look at this, this example. It was 104 degrees outside. It was 71 degrees inside. So as these two airflows passed, it changed that temperature to 75 degrees from 104. So the inbound fresh air was now only 75 and a half degrees. So I only had to cool four and a half degrees. Again, that's a 72% efficiency on the way back in. So that's, that's a beautiful thing. You know, if you're trying to run your air conditioning or something to that effect, now the air conditioning is only trying to pick up four degrees rather than uh, basically they're trying to pick up what, 25 degrees, 23 degrees here. So, or actually 33, yeah, excuse me, 33 degrees. So sensible recovery, again, this is one of those terms that they use to rate the ERVs to, um, to tell you, you know, if, like, like a mileage per gallon, if you will, that re sensible recovery efficiency is, is basically it's uh, looking at the total electric, electrical consumption of the motors, the case heat loss or heat gain, air leakage, that whole package where, where the total recovery efficiency is sensible plus latent. So they have a, uh, they take both the heat energy recovery and the, the moisture energy recovery and classify them as a, a value. The one thing about a total recovery efficiency is that an HRV will have a zero for a total recovery because they have no latent capability, right? Uh, an HRV cannot capture moisture. It runs it out through the condensate line. So it's, so when I, when I look at comparisons of products, I always go to the total recovery efficiency to see how our product rates because honestly, we, we have to capture some of that moisture as well. Otherwise, we're only doing half the job. So, so filtration is another key challenge. Anytime you bring supply air into a house or into a residential footprint, that supply air has to be managed. There's temperature, humidity, and particulate protection that has to be done. So we have to have some kind of a filter. Now, the International Mechanical Code says any supply air in the U.S. has to have a very minimum of a MERV-6. In a lot of different jurisdictions, that MERV, MERV is MERV-8. And in some places, like California, for example, they're required to have a MERV-13 filter. So from a manufacturer standpoint, that kind of variability in your filtration plays total havoc on our devices, right? So how do I have a fan? A fan pulling through a MERV-6 is going to be considerably different from a fan pulling through a MERV-8 or even a MERV-13, especially a MERV-13. However, it's so much better for the occupants to have that higher MERV value. So uh, this is kind of an example of what on the left, that's a MERV-8 filter. On the right is a MERV-6 filter. Anytime they, you see basically a plastic type filter um, without having any density, you know right away it's going to be a MERV-6 or less. To get to that MERV-8, it typically has to be a, a paper or a sponge like, a thicker sponge like material. Um, and then this, of course, this is the core assembly. And what happens is the airflow comes in on this side. If you can see my mouse and my mouse actually works. And then it passes through diagonally out the other side. So the return air will come through this side and pass through here on that side. But those two air streams are going by each other, but not touching each other. Back to that filter real quick, just to be clear, you know, the Probably the biggest thing I want to share about filters is that you can't take two MERV-6 filters and put them together and equal a MERV-12 filter, for example. Um, the holes in that MERV-6 filter are going to be just as big on the second one as they are on the first one. So anything that's passing through there will just continue to pass. Where a MERV-12 is going to be able to filter much, much smaller particulates. And that's that's really what we're looking for. Um, and in combination with a fan that has the capability of pulling against that static pressure that's created by that filter. So for us, we have our new IntelliBalance 200, a 200 CFM ERV. Um, 
we do just that. We add two twin, oh, wait, stop, come back. Two DC motors. You know, one of the cool things about this, and, and whenever I look at a, at a competitor's ERV and I see big open spaces inside the box of the ERV, I know for a fact that's kind of a problem, right? That, what that tells me that is there's, there's a lot of energy leakage or heat leakage or cooling leakage, however you want to frame that, throughout that can. So, and as well as if I see the motors, the motors are going to be making noise. So one of the things that we do, we have our motors nested on the back of the ERV up against this, uh, basically it's a polystyrene insulation. And then over the top of that, we're going to put our core exchanger. And then over the top of those, we're going to put our supply air filters and our exhaust air, our, our return air filters. So, and then on top of that, we're going to post, we're going to close that door with an insulated door. So our objective is that you don't hear those motors running. If you're hearing the motor, um, if the occupant hears the motor, they're going to be more inclined to shut the motor off. So we do like that. Uh, as far as sound is concerned, Panasonic has basically a great reputation for sound and we're continuing that process with this application. So twin DC motors, so I can pressurize either the exhaust air or the supply air. I can do a, I can do a, um, a depressurization strategy or a pressurization strategy, depending on what's going on in that house or where, we at, where we're at regionally. The boost function allows for what they call a party mode or, or um, if, if I were going to do like a bathroom or some such thing and I wanted to go to higher airflow, I could put the I would just enable the boost function. It would go to the higher airflow, and then I'd shut that off, and it comes back to my traditional continuous run low speed setting. Um, they have a MERV 13 supply air filter that comes with it, and an optional MERV 8 and a HEPA filter available. So if you're in a wildfire smoke or a, a, you know where you have a lot of red days or air pollution, you can go with a HEPA filter, which is far far and away better for um, smoke particulates than any other application so we we have that available um, the hepa filter is a thick filter um, so it's going to get soiled and and if you're going to do a hepa filter we're going to recommend that you change that or at least inspect that more often than you would say a merv 8. Um, the erv does not require a condensate line it's designed to stand alone and work on its own, or you can do the air handler uh, integration. You can put that right into the air handler unit and then um, it'll work just fine. It has these great little carrying handles for the installers. One of the things that we found was that these devices are big, first of all, and that it can be problematic for your installers to get them in some of the different spaces. So by putting handles on there, there's less chance for A, the installer to drop them, and B, for the installer to injure themselves trying to carry these devices. So, and then, of course, we have an optional remote liquid crystal display, which is, has been pretty popular as well. So key features, it's, you know, it's designed for a single family. Uh, at 200 CFM, according to ASHRAE, you can get up to about, I want to say... 7,000 square foot house that this will satisfy. Um, it's got the high efficiency core. It recovers recovering heat and balancing moisture. Um, the core materials permeate with an anti-mold treatment because what we want is we want that moisture to push through the core. We don't want moisture to sit in the core. This is one of the reasons they, they typically, we, in my opinion, we always recommend that you run the ERVs continuously. What can happen is if you have a high moisture load on either side and you shut the device off as if you were running it intermittently, that moisture could sit in that core now and hold on. So we don't want moisture to stay in the core. We want that air flows to continue to pull and push that moisture through the core. So, but if it did turn on and off, that's all right too. We have an anti-mold treatment in there that will help prevent that from uh, creating a problem within the core. So we have a separate control for continuous supply and exhaust, which allows you to, to give you pressurized or depressurized. Um, meets the different Ontario Energy Star codes. We have a six year warranty on the ECM motors and three years on all the parts. And we include static pressure ports with balancing instructions. For if, if you wanted to run that through the air handler unit, it'll help with balancing strategies for your installer. 
Um, the mounting installation, and this is actually kind of cool. First of all, I can mount it on the floor. So oftentimes they'll hang the ERBs from jack chains or they'll hang them from a wall. But in this case, I have uh, floor bumpers that allows me to hang it from the, to, to put it on the floor. If you're in an earthquake area, like in California, everything is gonna have to be strapped and this is gonna be of concern. You'll, you won't be able to use jack chain, you'll have to use threaded rod. Um, so by putting it on the floor, there's less chance it's gonna fall down, right? I mean, that's, that's the beauty of being able to mount that on the floor. The other thing that we can do for the installer is that you can take the inside ducting, both the return air and the supplier ducting, and move them to the side. So let's say I had it up on jack chain. I would take these two and run them outside for my outside supply and outside exhaust, but I could move this to the inside and now I can relieve some of the stress or some of the static pressure by having a straight duct run into a chase or wherever it's gonna go without having to add another 90 degree turn. So as far as control is concerned, all of our controls have, got, have been moved to the outside of the device. So if you're an installer, you don't have to break open the case to just the airflow, the supply air or the exhaust air. Or if you wanted to run the intermittent timer, you can do that from the outside of the device as well. There's no dip switches or anything like that to monkey with. So if you're going to do an intermittent application, so for example, let's say you needed 60 CFM continuous and I wanted to do an intermittent application, I would run it at the 120 CFM level for 30 minutes and I should have that arrow pointing towards the 30 minute because I would want to run it half the time. Now I've got 120 half the time, which is basically 60 minutes, 60 CFM continuous. So, and the pick flow allows me to be able to adjust that on the fly. So what that means is it's scalable in the sense that as a builder, if you have put, you know, you have a house, you might have a family of six or seven that moves in, or you might have a family of two or one. So you could basically scale that up and down depending on how many people are in the house, as well as what your square footage of the property is. Um, these are some of the charts that will help you identify based on square footage. Uh, I would, you know, I, I like these charts. They're a great, they're a great way to start with your uh, airflow requirements. Um, and then I kind of look at what the population of the property is because, you know, what. Uh, I've seen properties where we did one in Idaho, actually two houses in Idaho, side by side, Jack and Jill type applications. One had a family of nine living in it. One had a family of two. And the ASHRAE standard said they both have the same airflow requirements. And I'm here to tell you that's not the case. The family of nine needed considerably more airflow to keep the house comfortable. And we were able to make that adjustment because the airflow uh, the adjustments on the ERBs are are scalable. I can move up or down. So we also have our IntelliBalance 100 for less if you need less airflow, and that works the same way as the IntelliBalance 200. So I can fit all of these controls inside uh, the airflow range and, and, and use the intermittent component if I need to to get down to these lower airflows. The sub uh, 1,000 square foot airflows will require lower airflows, but I can run that intermittently now. Uh, the IntelliBalance 200 has a variety of speed control options. Um, I can marry that up to the air handler. Uh, I have a wall switch that I can turn it off and on. If I want to go on vacation, I can just turn it off from the wall switch. And then I also have a boost switch where that's my low to high speed. Um, and then the uh, there's also a port that will allow for uh, artificial intelligent type products, uh, whether it's Bluetooth or Zigbee or Z-Wave or or just open internet to ultimately be able to will be able to create this this module this receiver module and allow that to control from an app from a, um, some graphical user user interface. So that wall control is basically going to give you all the information that you hopefully will need: the indoor outdoor temperature and humidity, the filter maintenance reminder. Boom! You get a little check button. It'll tell you your ASHRAE air volume and boost timer. So I can set the ASHRAE, uh, I can set the air volume here. And then when I hit the boost, it'll give me a timer countdown to tell me how long it's going to be on automatically. Because when I hit the boost from the wall control, it's I can set that for a 20 minute, 30 minute, 40 minute countdown timer automatically. Just go back to the low speed. Um, it gives you the supply air exhaust volumes and you'll see this in all in a minute. 
and different system fault codes if in fact you, you need that. And it'll also tell you if your AI product is working or not. Basically, it's a four wire, it's a five volt to zero volt and a receive and a transmit wire. Pretty straight ahead to go to the wall control. Um, some of the different functions in and out, how to set them. Ah, here we go. Let's just take a quick look at how this works. All right, it's been energized. The wall control is now telling us that it's 75 degrees inside, but at 50% humidity, I turn the device on. The damper is going to open. And then it, it rushes up to the 200 CFM and then back down to the 120 CFM. And then if I want to change the 120 CFM, I'll go over, tell it what to do, and I'll lower it down to 60 CFM, set that, and then I can go to the other side, lower it to 60, and set that. All right, now my, my CFM is set at 60 CFM. I can hit the boost, and there's your 20-minute 20, 20 countdown timer as it runs up to 200 CFM. I can also adjust that 20-minute countdown timer down to 10 minutes or up higher if I wished. There we go. Now I can set the ASHRAE intermittent timer, not just to run 60 minutes, but if I wanted to run it 30 minutes per hour, there's my ASHRAE intermittent timer setting. But I like my continuous ventilation, so I'm going to go back and reset that to 60 minutes per hour. Boom, and there we go. And there's my outside temperature at 73 degrees, 53%. My inside is 75 degrees at 50%. My boost. And when you hit the boost, you're going to get a green light to tell you that it's on until it times itself out. And that's all that it takes to run through here. One of the cool features I wanted to share, though, is look at the power at 60 CFM. The unit draws about 10 watts of energy, which is just absolutely remarkable. So these are some of the different applications out there. Uh, you know, we're competitive on a number of different levels. Um, what I look for when I, when I look at these, by the way, as I'm one of the key features I'm looking for is when does that defrost cycle kick in? Because the challenge is with a defrost cycle is that it's going to go into what they call a recirculate mode, meaning it's going to recirculate the air back throughout the house. So here at 23 degrees versus 14 degrees, I have nine, a nine degree difference is monstrous in how your ERV is going to run and how long it's going to be in defrost. So uh, that is just a huge number. So I'm always looking to see which one will actually run during the cold temperatures versus not run. So I could get a, a much less expensive application, but it has no value if it doesn't get turned on, right? So, and then I also want to see what the uh, filtration is because I can have a great performance at a MERV 8, but if you go to a MERV 13, it won't, it won't work. Or if I have an area where it's required that I have a MERV 8 and it has a washable electric static panel, that doesn't cut it either. So this is completely out of the, out of the loop. Um, I do like the fact that I can positive, negative, or balanced, uh, balance the, the air flows. And these, you know, that's another thing I look for. And then where are the controls, right? So these are all dip switch controls. It means you have to go inside the device to modify that, which just, uh, is sometimes problematic. The other thing we can look at is what's the efficiency? What's the CFM per watt? 3.5 CFM for the Panasonic is considerably different than the 0 0.76, 0 0.97, or even the 2.13 for the Fantech. So these are absolutely phenomenal numbers when we look at that, and that's what makes the biggest difference, the power consumption at maximum rated uh, sensible recovery efficiency of 22 watts versus 154 and so forth. So physical size, in interestingly enough, this is the Brone equivalent, uh, which is a not a bad, it's not a bad program. It's it's a good ERV. But one of the things you'll note is that 
look at the size difference, right? So even though my device is heavier, and I, in my opinion, it's heavier because it's better insulated, it's got more control functions on the exterior, um, it's much smaller, right? It's much smaller physically. So as a builder, when you're looking at what the potential square footage of, of space that you're going to wind up with using these devices, that also has value. Uh, these are different applications. Again, there's the, there's what it looks like. There's your cores, your filters. This is your return air filter. Uh, to be clear, that return air filter is there to protect the core from dust from inside the house. That's what that's all about. So it's not a supply air filter where I have breathable air and I have to make special attention to that. Um, but it just filters the dust before it goes into the core. Help keeps our core intact. Duct orientation can be changed, just a quick, you know, refresher. So one of the things I look for when I look at an ERV and I want to know the airflow and what direction it goes, as soon as you look, and all ERVs will be this way, you're going to see a styrofoam or an insulated side. These ducts are insulated. That means they're going outside. So this would be the supply air and this would be the exhaust air. Um, but anything that has the potential to have a thermal bridge for temperature, is going to have this insulation. The inside, the inside, there is no insulation on it because typically the ERV is inside the envelope. So quick takeaways, twin ECM motors for custom air, uh, external speed controls, there's no dip switches, optional filter strategies, which are huge for episodic conditions, does not require a condensate line. I could put this with the air handling unit or not. The carry handles are, are great for moving the unit in and out from a contractor's perspective. The LCD display allows the homeowner to see what's going on inside and outside of the house. The low defrost temperature means the unit's gonna work all year long. Um, one of the things we found is that the painted casing is nice because it, in some places along the coast, you can have, uh, you'll get fingerprints on the, on the galvanized can casing. So, and then the other one was mass, right? Might is right. The mass makes the device quiet. So we couldn't be more excited about that. So at Panasonic, we have a complete coverage for every envelope size in that residential footprint. I have our little Whisper Comfort, which is a 20, 30, 40 CFM. Our IntelliBalance 100, which is primarily a single family, multifamily application for under 3000 square feet. And then the IntelliBalance now, if I'm going up to a larger single family property, uh, up to 7,500 square feet. So this is a, a, a nice little coverage path. There's that Whisper Comfort and the beauty of the Whisper Comfort, I can put it in the ceiling. It's what they call a cassette style. It also can go into the wall so I can put it in the wall and just duct it right out. I don't have to do a penetration through the fire damp or fire rated ceiling. Um, it's about 66% efficient. The 100, will hang from the wall, hang from jack chains. Again, all the controls are on the outside. Um, the International Mechanical Code now is rewarding contractors and, and design with a 30% reduction in, in ventilation if the house has a whole house balanced ventilation strategy. Okay, it wants you to be distributed and balanced. This means that if you're using an ERV, you can lower the airflow. Right, so now I don't have as much air change required, so I can get as, as I can get just as good at air change as um, as anything else, but lower speed. So if I were doing an exhaust only strategy, I'd have to have a higher speed. Long story short, the International Mechanical Code is is uh, adopted in 46 states, and the ones that you see that haven't adopted it are typically a higher mechanical code, a higher uh, a stronger strategy. So the, and then they have what they call stretch codes. So even though you have the mechanical code and the residential code, oftentimes they'll do a residential energy code or a stretch code. Here in Washington, we have a stretch code. California, their, Cal, their Title 24 is a stretch code. Nevada shows a stretch code. The B's code in, in Alaska. All of these other states have, have their own stretch codes that go above and beyond the International Energy Conservation Code. So you want to be conscious of that as a builder or a property owner when you go to remodel or investigate. So one of the things about ERVs right now is that, you know, 
we're kind of down here in the tech enthusiast, innovator, early adopter, visionary level, where exhaust fans to a builder, they're up here in that early majority, late majority level. So what you're seeing now is you're seeing the balanced ventilation strategies on the rise, essentially on the rise and being adopted. And, and you know what? We have a lot to thank for in this respect. And it's, it's a tough way to say it, but things like COVID have made indoor air quality and ventilation a household word. And it's it's been a real boom to all of us in this industry who have said for some time that, you know, we, we need to do more for our indoor air quality. Um, we need to manage the outdoor air that comes in as well. So, so what we're seeing now is we're seeing this initial takeoff and we're, we couldn't be more excited for it. So to understand the market, um, you know, in June, I don't have our July numbers yet, uh, but in the U.S. there were 589,000 building permits issued, of which, you know, that's a nice potential for, um, for the ERV or for the balanced ventilation industry. All of, not all, but the bulk of these will have to have a ventilation strategy. Why not do a better strategy? And if you're a builder, why not separate your product from the one down the road that's three or four years old that might be through two or three thousand dollars less than yours? How do you defeat that? How do you overcome that that price point difference? You sell more value, and that's what balanced ventilation will do. Is it'll bring more value to your product. So uh, from internally, we're advertising the ERVs on these uh, media footprints. Um, you know, and this is our way of getting that out. Uh, there's material available if you need. We can help you with different cell sheets or architectural specs or service manual. All of those are on our website. Um, there's competitive data if you need that. There's training. We can do certainly training anywhere you need it. Um, and that's our... That's our ERV family and the, the science behind ERVs and why we think they're they're going to be more and more important going forward. Matt, any thoughts? Yeah, I have several questions. I really do appreciate that, Ken. That was an excellent explanation of how ERVs, HRVs, the HR heating recovery ventilation system works, especially for those looking for that balanced ventilation. Uh, what, what I do want to talk about real quick, um, for, the, for the people that need to take a step back and try to understand what ventilation is in the first place, there's different types of ventilation strategies. You've got um, exhaust only, which is one of the ones you referenced in your presentation. This is more of a balance where you've got equal supply and return through something like an ERV. And then you also have supply side ventilation, which is uh, pressurizing the structure and kind of forcing the air out. Uh, one, of the, one of the points that you made, and uh, I've seen some studies on this, that you don't necessarily get a payback on the ERV from an energy um, standpoint. And um, well, one, one of the arguments I saw in this, uh, in this other study is, if you're bringing that unconditioned, um, unvented air in through one of these, these other strategies, the HVAC load that you're gonna have is gonna be a little bit higher if you're not exchanging the moisture load and the uh, the heat, uh, like through that enthalpic core on this, so I just wanted to get your your take on that um, because this this is sold as one of the more energy efficient ways because you need ventilation by code, and if you're going to do it, this is the more energy efficient way to do it versus one of the other strategies. Well, and that's that's true. It, it is more efficient. Um, I think the argument is though is that. The additional cost won't won't uh, be supported by the savings. The, the The initial cost of the installation won't be supported by the saving. However, I will tell you that if you are pressurizing, for example, um, moist air into your house and you don't manage that moisture, that moisture is going to go everywhere in your house, right? So, the fun water vapors or humidity, if you will is never a problem until it condensates. And what will happen is that moisture will seek out a cold surface in the house. So let's say you're in the, in the south in, in Atlanta, where you guys are from, and I drive 90% humid air in there at 90 degrees, and that comes into the air conditioned space. Any cool surface, typically a wall or a floor, is going to capture that moisture and now it's going to become kind of damp and wet. 
In fact, if you go into some of the old hotels in Florida and, you know, you walk in and you smell that musty, well, that's that's what's occurring. And, and the reason that you want to do that is because once it's conditioned, the reason they, they tend to do that, I should say, is because once that air is conditioned inside the house via the air conditioning, which pulls that moisture out, then you pressurize that out against the outside wall. And now it goes out and the humidity is lower as it goes to the higher temperature. So it doesn't drop that moisture into the interstitial space of the wall. So you might have moisture in the flat areas in the house where that cool surface has been, but you won't have it between your walls. So and obviously it's easy to replace a carpet. So, so from that standpoint, if you want to talk about long-term maintenance, you probably could get an ROI. Right, because the long term maintenance on the inside of the property is going to be considerably less when you use the ERV to strip some of that moisture out before it comes in. Um, in the north, in the north, the northern climates and where I live, we we can use an exhaust strategy because it'll be 38 degrees at 80 percent humidity outside or even I mean, I've seen it 38 degrees at 99 percent humidity outside my house. I mean, it's just raining as hard as possible at 38 degrees. Right. But my house is 70 degrees. When that air comes into the house, it warms it up. Well, 98% humidity at 38 degrees is, is barely 50% humidity at 70 degrees. So I'm okay bringing air in, sucking air from the outside in, in the, in the northern climates. But in the southern climates, you don't want to just suck it through that interstitial space and have it cool as it passes that space. We want to bring it in collectively, manage it. And that's the key word here manage the moisture and the temperature before it can be you know sprayed off into that into the living area um, because literally it will once it hits that air conditioned air it's going to want to rain so in in that climate or in that scenario i want to use some sort of dehumidification potential or or um really dehumidification probably the best way to go uh, but the erv will help will help manage some of that moisture it but, you know, on a 90 degree day when you've got a hurricane coming through there and you're at 99 percent humidity, that ERV is going to work like a fiend, but it's not going to solve all your all your moisture problems coming into the house. And, and you know, with respect, moisture is one of the bigger challenges to a builder, um, yep. because at the end of the day, the builder is responsible for moisture damage for the first couple of years of that house. So, you know, we're going to we're going to highly recommend that you do a a moisture mitigation strategy and the ERV is just one component of that. Yeah, and you brought up several good points there. Um, well, first of all, I was talking to uh, a representative from the, the National Wood Flooring Association. And he, he brought up an excellent point. He says like your hardwoods are is having hardwoods shrink and contract is a very expensive barometer to see <laughs> what's happening inside the house. So it's best to use these ventilation strategies, controlled ventilation strategies, um, you know, with dehumidification, with this balanced uh, ERVs instead of just, because if, you, if you're doing ventilation only, you're basically sucking in unconditioned air and that, that air is either gonna have high humidity or low humidity, which is going to affect the finishes. So in the summertime- which can, It yeah, can affect the finishes, which, right. Yeah, which can affect the finishes. Well, I mean, in, in, mo in most houses, it, 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 I mean, hardwoods are one of them. When the doors stick during the summertime and in, mm. in, in humid climates, that's that's showing that you have excess humidity inside the house that's not being managed. And you try you want to try and keep it between that, that 40 and 60%. But you brought right. up another point, and I, and I think a lot of people are confused about ERVs versus dehumidifiers. Uh, they think an ERV is a dehumidifier, where in fact, you said there's, there's, no con there's nothing inside it to uh basically have that condensation uh actually you're trying to avoid condensation because it's going to produce mold and you're not going to have a drain inside it so kind of tell us why this is not uh, when people call this a dehumidifier they're they're in fact they're wrong yeah so it's not a dehumidification and I, I'll, I'll repeat that it's not a heater it's not an air conditioner it's yeah. not a dehumidifier and it's not a humidifier what it's going to do is it's going to balance those two air streams. But if I'm 70% humidity in the house and I'm 90% humidity outside, I'm going to balance the two air streams at 80% humidity, right? So which is still too high. It's, it's, it's going to help, but it's not going to solve all of the problems. Again, you know, I, I'm going to go back to our ventilation strategies has to be, they have to be predictable and uneventful, meaning that 
I want the air that comes into my house to be um, predictable and uneventful. I'd like to come in at 60%, no more than that. I'd like to come in at a certain temperature range, no more, no less. Um, and I can do that with the ERV. Now, here's another challenge. Let's say you were running air conditioning and you had that 100 degree temperature outside at 90% humidity. Your air conditioner won't be able to keep up with that humidity either, right? So it's going to need help to, to manage that humidity. The, all heating systems, um, when you start getting to higher than a 30 degree delta, are, are going to struggle, right? They're not designed to manage, you know, a 30 degree temperature difference inside to outside. They want to use basically a cold air return. We call it a cold air return, but literally it's just the house air. So if I'm trying to heat my house to 70 degrees, I'm going to recirculate that 68 degree air that's cool, and it's going to heat that to 70 degrees. Okay, and in air conditioning, it's going to want to take a 75 degree air and cool that to 70 degrees. It does not like a hundred degree air trying to cool to 70 degrees. It just won't be able to keep up. So the ERV by keeping that, that air moderate between those two air streams, right? By moderating those two temperatures will allow the heating and the air conditioning to actually work effectively. Um, otherwise you're, you're, you will fail your system in, in that respect. You won't get the expected outcomes that you think you should have. And, and, you know, for us, one of the challenges, you know, is um, even in my house, right? Uh, I would, my wife would would poke me in the ribs when the furnace came on because for the first minute it would blow cold air out of my ducts, right? Because she would be saying, "Oh, the furnace isn't working. The furnace isn't working." And literally, there was just air in the ducts that was cold because it was from under the house, and you had to wait for that warm air to get there. So her expectation of heat was that it was immediate, um, and that's just a. a you know, people have expectations. When I say I have the heating heat on, they expect heat. When I have the air conditioning on, they expect cool. And that's not always the case because the devices have limitations, obviously. So ERVs will help with that. And they'll give you filtered air. And remember when we talk about supply air versus exhaust air, the supply air is the most expensive air. And the reason being is because it's code required to have that filtration. It's generally, generally, not code, but generally required to have a dehumidification or a humidity strategy. And it's generally required to be somehow tempered so that you're not bringing in, you know, if you're in Fairbanks, Alaska, and it's minus 13 degrees, you don't want minus 13 degree air coming into your house, right? Just as if you're in, in, in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and it's 105 outside, you don't want 105 degree air to come into your house. We have to, we still have to have fresh air circulating through because as a human, we outgas, I think I read it was about six to eight liters of air a minute. So if you want to picture, you know, uh, four two liter soft drink bottles, every minute are, are being outgassed into the atmosphere we're, we're breathing. So if you're in a smaller house and you're looking at low ceilings and small and short walls, you know, you're saying, I've got six, you know, four to four of these things, two liters every minute over the course of it, even an hour, you fill that air with rebreathe with, you know, with your own breath. So whatever anybody else, whether it's the kids, your spouse, my dog over here, whatever he's breathing out is also in that air. So we want to exchange that air because that air is really in the long term, it's problematic, right? Um, so, so it sounds like I mean, really the bottom line for ERV and the reason for ventilation, uh, one, humans need oxygen. Um, when, you, when you say that these are designed for the spaces where you're willing to take a nap or sleep, you need oxygen in those areas because carbon uh, dioxide can build up in those areas. And two, we're trying to get rid of some of the pollutants, like while bringing the fresh air, the oxygen, we're trying to get rid of some of the PM 2.5 out of the air so we can breathe better. So I mean, ultimately, this is doing two things at the same time. It's getting rid of some of the bad air, but also bringing in some of the good air. Because if you don't have something like this at night, you shut the door and you're not basically circulating air with the rest of the house or the, or the AC, your, H, your heating and ventilation system is not running. You may not have enough um, uh, oxygen in those areas. And that's, that's where some of these uh, balanced uh, ventilation systems are, are very useful. 
Right. Well, you know, and I, I'll go back to um, the we want it to be predictable and uneventful, right? I, I have people that say, oh, you know, it's 70 degrees outside. I just have my windows open. And I'm trying to explain to them that air moves via pressure differential, right? I mean, I have to have more pressure on one side to get it to move to a lower pressure space. And literally, this is what we're doing with an ERV. I'm pressurizing one side, depressurizing the other. So I create this pathway of airflow. So back to the 70 degrees, if it's 70 degrees outside to 70 degrees inside and there's no wind blowing, the air is not moving, right? So you could have your windows open all day and you're still not necessarily moving air in or out. Uh, and you put a screen on that for for pests or whatnot, and you're even less movement, right? So um, again, we want airflow to be predictable and uneventful, right? I don't want to have to wait for the wind to blow. I don't want to wait for a big temperature difference to move air because temperature will change the air pressure, of course. Colder temperature has a lower pressure than warmer temperature, so uh, which is stack effect by the way why why it's warmer at the top of your two-story house than at the bottom it's heating that up inside the core and being captured on top and now it's just leaking out on the top uh so so it, expectations are huge you know from the occupant side um we certainly want it to be predictable and uneventful and and that's what the erv will do for you it really will it'll balance that temperature inside to outs uh balance the temperature all throughout the house i should say and then it'll help with that, manage that moisture load to keep it within the boundaries of, of acceptable, of an acceptable level. Uh, you bring up a good point, and I did, do need to mention this. It's um, for uh, building science and, 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 and high performance builders. You know, really, the theory is to, to build tight, tight building envelope with very little air exchanges and then ventilate right. So when right. you've got that stack effect, you are inadvertently creating a, that's a ventilation strategy in itself. It's natural ventilation. So basically if you have holes in your building envelope, as the heat rises, you've got that makeup air, that fresh air coming in from the crawl space, from the lower level walls, wherever you, you're kind of below that equilibrium, where you've got the negative pressure and you've got the positive pressure towards the top of the house. Problem with that is like you're sucking in who knows what, especially towards the bottom, you've got radon, you've got soil gases, you've got pesticides, uh, lots of things outside, um, even though the air typically is cleaner outside than it is inside, but you want to control what is coming inside and you also want to make sure that it's filtered. So an ERV by itself or ventilation, uh, it, it just uh, powered ventilation by itself is not necessarily going to make a, a difference if the house is leaking like a sieve because you're not really controlling anything if the house is, you know, if the wind blows through it and you have one air exchange every five minutes, that's just not a very good ventilation strategy. Well, it, you know, and I, I'm a big advocate for tightening the house. And, and I, I'll give you an example of, of the way it used to be and the way we hope it to, it's moving towards. But, you know, let's say you have a thousand square foot house, right? And you have an eight foot ceiling. That's 8,000 cubic feet of area in that house. And we measure, we measure the tightness of a house by its air change, right? How many mm -hmm. air changes? Well, 10 years ago, it would, be, it would not be uncommon to see a seven air change envelope, right? It would naturally, you could move seven air changes or seven times 8,000 cubic feet per hour. You know, <laughs> that's a lot yeah. of air change. So if you were trying to heat that in the winter, that you're just flushing that air, that warm air right out of the house. So now today's standards, you know, you're about three air change. So now you're three times 8,000 cubic feet, about 24,000 cubic feet of air. But even if you had that to less than one air change, you know, your ERV, your, your ASHRAE standard calls for about 30 CFM per, you know, for 30 CFM for per minute, cubic feet per minute. So over the course of an hour, six times three is, it's about 1800 CFM. So that's, that's how much air change is required. Not 24,000 cubic feet, not, you know, 56,000 cubic feet for these larger air changes. Yep. So the lower... The lower that air change, the less you're going to heat or air condition that outside space. And that's that's a for some reason a lot of people struggle to to capture that and why that's important. Now that's where tightening an envelope has a huge return on your investment, right? If you want to know where to spend a thousand dollars on your house, I'm gonna argue put more insulation yep. to tighten the envelope, right? That's the very first thing. I, I would do that before I bought a new furnace because a new furnace is simply going to punch more heat out those open spaces. 
So it's, you know, it's essentially close the window for heaven's sakes. Um, so, but the fresh air that you need is important. I mean, it's an important as a, as a function for us as human beings. So, so the ERV can manage that and give you a predictable fresh air. It's filtered, it's tempered. Um, moisture is, you know, first of all, there's moisture is balanced, you know, from outside to inside, whether it's within those parameters is generally, it's generally going to be the case. There will be days when it won't be able to capture those parameters and you'll have to either dehumidify, have a, you know, a little pickup device, or you'll have to humidify depending on where you're at. So, um, so start with the ERV, start with tightening the envelope, had the ERV. Yeah, you bring up a good point, Ken. Um, and a lot of times people ask me, uh, what, you know, you know, as a, as a energy improvement contractor, in addition to building new homes, like what is the order of operations? And people always want to go with a sexy thing first. They want to go with solar first. It's like, Hey, I want to, I want to be environmentally conscious. I want to, I want to create renewable energy, clean energy. Um, and I tell them like really the, you know, bang for the buck, you know, stopping energy loss is the most important thing. So air seal, then insulate, not insulate, then air seal, air seal, then insulate then design your mechanical systems based on that new climate that you've created with a tight building envelope and good insulation. And then once you've exhausted all of your energy efficiency options, then you can add solar because you can't, you don't have enough roof space on a leaky house to completely power your house if the house is not very energy efficient. However, if it is energy efficient, you know, there is a possibility where you can create a condition of net zero energy where you can actually create enough energy with the solar to power your house if it is designed to be energy efficient, but it's solar's the last thing. Mechanicals needs to be designed based on the building envelope air exchanges. Even an ERV, like the the ERV charts that I've seen out there, are based on you know, leaky house, uh, not so leaky house, uh, new house built to code, and then basically passive house. So an ERV is going to be based on how many air exchanges you already have in the house. And that's the ventilation strategy. Right. Well, ERV efficiencies are targeted for specific airflows, right? Mm -hmm. So so if you have to have this monstrous airflow to accommodate, you know, a leaky house just to get that air moving around there, that's going to be a monstrous ERV. Uh, yep. A smaller ERV will do the work of a monster one if I have a good, clean envelope. It's, the envelope is the critical component. You're right. Well, I, I do appreciate your time with this, and I, and I, I love the fact that you guys are going to be our ventilation partner on the 1920s makeover ATL, and that you guys are also sponsors on Rated Green, so we can continue to talk about uh, this message of indoor air quality, because that is one of the, the things that I try to incorporate into all the houses that we design and construct, and also on Rated Green. That is one of our ongoing themes is indoor air quality in addition to outside air quality, but it's talking about what does that mean? How do we achieve that? Um, because we all talk about ventilation. We talk about indoor air quality and, it's, and it sounds great, but it's like, okay, what's next? What is the plan? And every house is different. Every building's different. Every structure's different. And I think it needs to be a designed system. And this is definitely one of the ones that most of the codes are recommending um, is that balanced, it, it will even like the indoor air quality plus, they're looking for a balanced uh, uh, management system uh, like an ERV. Exactly, exactly. Well, you let me know, Matt, how I can help you and your, your uh, people who, who come to the Radiant Green site. I would, I, you know, I always enjoy talking. Sadly, I'm a bit of a nerd when it comes to air quality and I'm I always enjoy talking to, to different builders and contractors about how we can get the best strategy for their situation. So, um, and we'll all learn together. I mean, I can certainly bring what I know yeah. and they bring what they know. And and we're our goal really is to create a better living environment for the occupant, for the earth, for everything, right? How do we raise the bar? So 